Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm going to share with you this case of a patient who had posterior capsule rupture. And so do as I say, not as I did. But thankfully, this patient did quite well. You'll see the maneuvers that I made once I recognized the posterior capsule rupture and how I was able to manage this as well as still put the lens within the capsule or bag and avoid needing to do a vitrectomy. So I'm using a corneal marker, which will help me to center and size my rexus. Using the cotton tip, I'm steadying the eye, and I make my paracentesis incision first on the right side and then the left side, making sure I'm flat to the iris plane, which creates a nice corneal shelf, which will allow me to achieve a self-sealing incision. This is intracameral lidocaine, and then some intracameral epinephrine. You can see this pupil is a little bit on the medium size, and so I'm gonna use a little epinephrine to help me. And then this is some dispersive viscoelastic to dilate the pupil and fill the chamber and coat the corneal endothelium. Holding the eye with the cannula, this is a triplanar corneal incision. I make a vertical groove, place the blade into the deep part of the groove, tunnel through the cornea, and controlling the eye with the cannula, I'm able to control the length of the incision, and then I enter. I push some more viscoelastic at the end, and this is the puncture style rexus. I use the forceps to puncture the center, pull down, and try to redirect the tear toward me with the teeth together, grabbing the right side of the tear, which creates the flap. And then I'll go ahead and grab the flap, going around circumferentially, using the corneal mark that I made prior to guide me on the size and the centration of the rexus. Whenever you're dealing with a smaller pupil, you always have to be mindful about the caps or bag and the zonules. So I go ahead and finish off the rexus, burp some viscoelastic out. This is the capsular fornix hydrodissection technique. I place the cannula under the rexus edge contraincisionally, point the tip down. I didn't get really a very good wave there, but a little bit. Decompress on the left side, turn the cannula to the right, pointing down. You can see the lens starts to spin a little bit here. As I push it side to side, I'm able to get the lens to turn quite nicely here now. So I go ahead and irrigate the surface of the cornea, adjusting the sleeve, lifting the incision with a chopper, going in with irrigation off to minimize decimase trauma, removing the surface epinuclear material, placing the chopper underneath the rexus edge, contraincisionally, pointing the fake tip vertically, subincisionally, getting it deep bisecting the lens, bringing the instruments together, crushing the lens with mechanical forces. That's double chop, placing the chopper around the right hemineucleus, pulling it centrally toward the ficker tip, and then bisecting the right hemineucleus. That is cross chop. You use a little bit of vacuum to pull that first quadrant up and emulsify it, placing the chopper around the second quadrant, lifting it up out of the bag, crushing it with the instruments and emulsifying the lens pieces. Grabbing trying to turn the lens so I can get to that one fragment there. That's the remaining part of that second quadrant. Lift it up with some vacuum and then emulsify the lens pieces. I turn the second hemineucleus in front of me, placing the chopper around the lens, placing the fake tip deep so that it bisects the lens completely, dividing the lens into two pieces grabbing the third quadrant and crushing it between the instruments and then emulsifying the lens pieces. Turning the fourth quadrant around, getting the chopper around it, pulling it centrally towards the fake tip, bisecting it. Again, because the crushing force is towards the center, this is very safe on the zonules. And because you're just using your fake tip and the chopper, you don't really need any additional instruments or devices for this maneuver using some vacuum to pull that last fragment up, crushing the lens between the chopper and the fake tip and emulsifying the lens pieces. Once the 
endonucleus is removed. I'm going to plan to start removing the epinucleus, grabbing the epinucleus. But in this case, the epinucleus is very adherent to the capsular bag. And so this is a challenge here. I'm trying to delicately grab the anterior edge of the epinucleus, but it wants to go right back. Even though I grab it, I'll grab a little bit of it, and then it wants to prolapse back into place. So I'm pulling it. So this is a thick, thick and adherent epinucleus. So this is where I'm gonna to try to get around the lens. I'm trying to get around the epinucleus. I'm loosening it. I'm retracting the pupil on this left side. And I'm gonna grab the epinucleus, lift it up, and I start to remove the epinucleus. But this is the thing. There is actually a tear in the posterior capsule. And if you haven't seen it, as you pay attention here, you should. So I'm pushing BSS. What happened? Where is the tear? It's right here. And this is another reason why I push BSS at the end of every maneuver and I like to keep the chamber filled. So as I was hooking the chopper to retract the iris, as I grabbed the epinucleus, it also broke the posterior capsule. In retrospect, I could have hooked the epinucleus up with the chopper away from the capsule, and that would have been a better technique. But again, I think this was bad luck. I've done this maneuver in the past and it hasn't caused a problem. But again, when you're dealing with cataract surgery, things do happen. And so even though I grabbed the epinucleus, it was very thick and uh, firm. It didn't want to collapse into the baco tip. Obviously, it tore the posterior capsule right in that corner. And you saw I, I never let the chamber collapse, and this is good habit. In this case, it worked out because I filled the eye with viscoelastic. And I'm going to remove the cortex, but guess what? I'm going to decrease the IOP. I want to decrease the hydration, the pressure head going into the eye because I don't want to hydrate the vitreous. I push some viscoelastic over the defect, and I turn the IOP way down. So very carefully, I'm going to remove the cortical material away from the tear there. Trying to remove the subincisional cortical material here. And then I'm going to start polishing. It's a fairly clean bag. That epinucleus was so stubborn and adherent, and most of that cortex was adherent to that epinuclear shell there. Again, I'm just trying to stay away from the defect which is towards my left there. I'm pushing more viscoelastic as I come out but not too much because you don't want to propagate the tear. You don't want to increase intracapsular pressure. And so where should I put the lens? Should I put a three piece in the sulcus? Should I put the three piece in the bag? Should I put a one piece in the bag? Because of the direction of the tear, it was really, the tear is oriented towards the periphery. It's not coming towards me. It's actually the ends of the tear is going towards the left. I felt pretty confident that the remainder of the posture capsule was going to remain intact. So very carefully, I'm injecting the one-piece lens into the bag. And since the lens unfolds fairly slowly, I'm able to use a cannula to mechanically dial the haptics into the capsular bag because I want to orient the haptics 90 degrees away from the capsular tear there. Still on the low IOP setting here, I go in with irrigation off, activate irrigation, and then carefully remove the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. And just very gently trying to rock the lens so the viscoelastic comes out from the bag. I'm looking at the tear the entire time. It has not propagated at all. 
Removing the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. So, so far the lens looks like it's in fairly good position. I'm rocking the lens. And you can see the tear still on the left side. It hasn't grown. I don't see any vitreous in the anterior chamber, but this is the key. I need to make sure the haptics are not going to be near that tear. And so I'm using the Maltzman to kind of tilt the lens. You can see the tear is still localized in that left side. push PSS as I come out and then I quickly hydrate the incisions because I don't want the chamber to collapse and encourage any vitreous to come forward. So thankfully there's no vitreous. I doubt that the hyaloid face was ruptured in this case. Again, because I always try to keep the eye inflated. This was good in this situation because I was able to identify the tear and keep the chamber formed. You can see the lens is well centered. The haptics are oriented away from the tear. Just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna go ahead and use the Maltman to retract the iris. And you can see that tear is well away from the haptic right there. However, the distal end might be approaching that tear. And so you can see I'm using the Maltzman to dial the haptic again, a little bit clockwise. And you see that's the rest of the tear there. You can see the proximal haptic, the trailing haptic is well away from the tear there. And so I just rotated the lens about, you know, 10 degrees to make sure that distal bulb of that haptic wasn't going to be near, anywhere near that tear on the left side. So I definitely rotated the haptics away from the tear. The lens was well centered and this patient did quite well and was essentially a routine cataract case with a posterior capsule rupture and a single piece lens into the capsular bag. So I hope this was helpful to you, and I thank you for your attention.